Hello, welcome to the lecture to go over home and automobile insurance. This is found in chapter eight of your textbook. We're gonna learn a lot of really important information that you will definitely need to use in your lifetime. So insurance is such an important thing to have in place and to understand what you're signing up for. But why do we even have insurance in the first place? Well, it's protection against any kind of possible financial loss. So we have to figure out what we could experience that would cause us financial loss and see if there's insurance to cover that. It allows us to be prepared for the worst and it can cover us for that. Um, provides protection against risk such as unexpected property loss, illness, and injury. The insurance company, also known as the insurer, agrees to bear the risk of losses that may happen. So the purpose of it is that we know that there are risks in having a home, having an automobile, and later on, another chapter, we'll talk about health insurance. So the insurance company bears that risk and they help you to pay for the financial struggles that you face whenever you do have some kind of financial loss. A premium is the amount that the policyholder, that would be you, they pay for the insurance. So you're paying that maybe every month or every six months or maybe every year, depending on which kind of insurance it is and how your policy is set up. That is your premium, the amount that you're paying on a regular basis in order to have that risk put on the insurance company. So we have different types of risk. Risk itself is just the chance of loss or injury. And peril is anything that may possibly cause loss. So that could be a tornado, a flood, a car accident. It could be um, an earthquake theft, any of that would be considered peril. Hazard is anything that increases the likelihood of loss through some peril. So you might live in a area that is prone to flooding. It might be a hazardous area for flooding. Or maybe you are one who texts and drives. Please don't do that. That would definitely increase the likelihood of loss through some type of peril. It would, uh, it would increase the likelihood of having a car accident. Even though you think you have it in control, if something happens around you, you may not be able to react nearly as quickly as you need to for that situation. Three different types of risk. We have loss of income or life due to illness, disability, old age, or unemployment. That is personal risks. You personally have the risk of getting sick, having some kind of illness. Just as you get older, there are more risks and unemployment is a personal risk. Property risks, that's gonna be the losses to property. That could be your home, your um, assets inside your home, your car that are caused by perils such as fire, theft, and hazards. And then there's liability risk. That's the losses caused by negligence. So when you are acting without um, thinking, you're doing something without using common sense or taking the precautions you should, that would be negligence, that lead to injury or property damage. So texting and driving could definitely be a liability risk. That is a negligent activity to take your eyes off the road and text and drive or to eat a salad while you're driving, which I used to do when I was a teenager. And I look back and think, what was I thinking? I was going down the interstate eating a salad while, while driving. What a crazy risk I was taking for my own life and other people's lives by doing that. It's important to you know, be able to stay focused and not be distracted while driving. So what do we do with all that risk? We know that risk exists but it's all about how we manage the risk for ourselves, our family, and for our property. So here's some different ways that we can plan to protect those things. Four different general risk management techniques. First, there's risk avoidance. So avoiding risk could just be completely eliminating the possibility of that happening. 
If I don't hang glide, then I am not taking, I'm completely avoiding the risk of being injured or killed in a hang gliding accident. Or I could take it to an extreme of if I don't drive anywhere or ride in a vehicle, then I am completely avoiding the risk of getting in a car accident. You know, the hang gliding, that's something reasonable, realistic that I can avoid. Driving or riding in a vehicle, that is not realistic. It's not a good idea for someone to just sit in their house all the time, not get a job or anything because they're so afraid of a car accident. So that would be risk avoidance, which sometimes is something we can do, but in a lot of situations, you can't avoid risk. So next would be risk reduction. Since there is a possibility, there is a risk of getting in a car accident, I can reduce risk of injury by wearing a seatbelt. I can reduce risk of injury by staying focused on the road and not being distracted by eating or texting or looking at my phone in whatever form. That's all risk reduction. I can reduce my risk of getting lung cancer by not smoking. So that's a much more reasonable way to look at it. And then there's risk assumption. So this is saying, you know what, I know there's a risk and I need to consider what the possibilities are here. Is this something that I just need to accept that this is a possibility or do I need to put this risk on someone else? So one example of that is collision. Collision is a type of insurance you can get where it is not only going to cover your own vehicle in an accident, but it will cover, um, it, it will not only cover someone else's, it'll also cover your own. So if there's something that you do, you know, you run into a telephone pole, if you don't have collision insurance, then it's not going to cover that. A lot of people don't have collision. It's not a requirement. So here's kind of what to think about there. If I have a really old car, is it worth me paying the extra for insurance and definitely look into the price difference? Or would I say, you know what, if I get a ding on my car, I'm going to be fine with that. I don't want to pay the extra for insurance. So that's something that you can assume that risk and say, you know, if I do mess up my own car, I'm just going to have to pay for that out of my pocket instead of paying extra on my insurance. Self-insurance is another risk assumption where you are taking on the risk of not having health insurance. So you are saying, instead, I'm going to put money to the side so that I can pay for my own doctor's visits and things. Of course, there's a huge risk that you'll have something very serious happen and you will not have the money to pay for that. So that is a risk assumption that you can consider taking. And this is where we come into true insurance, risk shifting. When we shift our risk, we know that there's a risk there and we shift it, we are giving that risk to the insurance company. We're saying, you know what? We know that there's a possibility that I could have a house fire. Unfortunately, that is a possibility. But I don't want to assume that risk to where I would lose everything. I would lose all of the money I've invested in my home and all of my property. So I am going to get homeowner's insurance or renter's insurance, which will cover all the things inside of the, or on the property besides the home itself. And if something happens, then I won't have to worry about the financial side of that. Now there is a deductible that you pay with insurance. So a deductible is a, an amount you pay before the insurance kicks in. Typically it's like $500 or so. Um, you could get it more or less. But what that means is, let's say there is a minor fire in your house. Maybe you lose half of a room, you know, which can be very pricey. They're going to have to rebuild that. You're going to have to replace some furniture. Well, you first have to pay your deductible. So let's say it's $500. You would pay $500 towards the repairs, and then the insurance company would cover the rest up to a certain amount. So that's what a deductible is. We'll talk about that a little bit more in this chapter. So it's really important after we think about the risks and think about what we want um, to cover, we need to do a lot of planning when it comes to insurance. These things don't just happen on their own. It takes us planning for insurance and planning for our future in order for it to take place. So 
First, we have to set our insurance goals. You know, what is it that I need to insure? Do I need to insure my apartment? Yes, the answer is yes. Do I need to insure my car? Yes, you have to do that. Whatever it may be, do I need to insure my jewelry? You know, personally, I don't have very expensive jewelry, but some people do. And maybe that's a goal you need to have is to get that jewelry covered so that if you lost it or it was stolen, you could be financially reimbursed for that. Step two, develop a plan to reach your goals. So you need to meet with somebody. And nowadays you can definitely do it through Zoom or you can do it over the phone. You can meet with an insurance agent and discuss the things you wanna insure, how much it's gonna cost, and work on reaching those goals. And then step three, put that plan into action. Okay, so I've talked to the person. I now have set aside this amount of money in my monthly or yearly or whatever budget to pay the insurance and I'm putting it into action. I'm gonna get the insurance plans. And then step four, with any, anything like this where we go through a process, we always wanna have our last step to check your results, to constantly look back and analyze, is this still working for me? Is this still the best decision? Have they raised rates a lot? And now I need to look at other companies that could possibly offer the same exact coverage for a smaller amount. And I'll tell you, when it comes to insurance, it does usually pay off every three to four years to change insurance companies because they do continue to raise your rates. They're not your best friend and they look at you as a loyal customer, so they're gonna keep giving you discounts. Instead, insurance companies give discounts in the beginning to get you on board and then they just raise them gradually. All right, home and property insurance. So homeowner's insurance covers your place of residence, so your, your house, and the associated risks. In this picture, they're having a bad day. This is a 2020 representation right here. We've got a fire, tornado, and a flood going on at this house. So hopefully everybody made it out safely there. Um, so we have renter's insurance, which we discussed in the last chapter, how it's really important to cover your property inside of your apartment or townhome or house or whatever it is that you're renting. Even though the property itself is not yours, you may have furniture, jewelry, um, appliances, artwork, whatever it may be, you wanna get that insured. And it's usually very cheap. Um, and then there's homeowner's insurance, which is gonna be for your house the, and the items inside of your house. So it's good to do an inventory and have a good idea of what it would cost to replace those items. It's even a good idea to go through and take pictures of each room of your house. So if you were to lose everything, you could show the insurance company um, pictures of everything you had and prove to them the value that they need to return to you. And um, then there's also personal property floater insurance, which will cover things like your jewelry or artwork. Um, you know, I was watching a show that had a celebrity on there the other day, and he bragged that his shoes, which were diamond, covered in diamonds, that they were, I think, $2.4 million. First of all, that just makes me mad because I'm like, you know how many good things he could do with the money he spent on those shoes? Ah, I don't even wanna think about it, but I guarantee you those things are insured with this personal property floater insurance to cover the cost in case somebody tries to steal those shoes off of his feet. All right, actual cash value. So when we're talking about actual cash value is how much is this, um, the payment going to be from the insurance company. It's going to be based off of the replacement cost for the item you lost minus depreciation. Now depreciation is the loss of value of an item as it gets older. So let's say you have your cell phone. My cell phone is about four years old now. I got to tell you, I don't love new technology. So I like to keep these things as long as I possibly can so I don't have to learn any new technology or spend the money on it. But each year that phone is losing value. Each year 
your car is losing value. As you drive your car, it is getting wear and tear and it's losing value. It's depreciating. So we can decide how long do we think an item will last. Let's say my phone will last four years because that is about what I'm getting out of it. It is, it is dying on me. So I would depreciate it over four years. So every year I would decrease it by a fourth, by 25% of the cost I paid for it. So let's look at an example so you can see what I'm saying. So let's say you bought a laptop and you expect it's gonna last for five years. If you were to lose that laptop, the replacement cost right now would be about $1,000. Well, you've already had it for two years, so it's not like you have a brand new laptop. So if it was gonna last for five years, then every year you're losing a fifth of the value, which would be 20%. You've already had it for two years, so it's going to lose a total of 40%, which would be 40% of $1,000 would be $400. So now your laptop is basically worth $600. That's the payment you would actually get from the insurance company. They're not going to give you the money for a brand new item when your item was not new at the point that you lost it. All right, and in this example for replacement, we actually have personal property that's gonna increase in, in value. So what would it cost an insurance company to replace a family's personal property that originally cost $20,000? The replacement cost for the new item has increased by 30%. So the replacement cost is going to be the original cost times one plus the percentage that it's increased. So 1.3 in this situation, one plus 30%. So the replacement cost would be 26,000. All right, so there are factors affecting how much your homeowner's insurance is going to cost. So let's look at those now. First of all, there's location of home. You know, just like a home varies in how much it's going to cost if you buy it in Los Angeles or you buy it in Greenville or you buy it in Pickens, it's the same way with homeowner's insurance. The, locations, the location of the home is going to vary for that reason. And the fact that maybe you're in an area that gets lots of tornadoes or in an area that gets lots of hurricanes or floods or whatever it may be, that is that location aspect is going to affect the home insurance cost. What type of structure is it? Is it a brick home? Is it a modular home? Is it a trailer? You know, whatever different, whatever kind of home it is, that is going to affect the homeowner's insurance. The coverage amount and policy type. So how much do you need covered? And there are different types of policies. So let's look at this example here. It says an increase in a deductible will reduce your premium. So remember the deductible is what you have to pay before the insurance company pays anything. If you have a tree fall in your house, you have a $500 deductible and it's gonna cost $5,000 to fix your house. You pay 500, the insurance company pays 4,500. So in this scenario, it says, suppose your homeowner's insurance premium is $800 with a deductible of 250. So they're paying $800 every year. And if they have something, a claim, they have something happen, it's gonna be $250 before the insurance kicks in. If you were to increase the amount of your deductible, so instead of only having to pay 250, you would now have to pay 500 before the insurance would kick in you can reduce your premium by 10% or $80. 10% of 800 is $80. So you would save $80 a year by increasing your deductible. So that's something to consider. All right, and then you also can get home insurance discounts. You've all seen commercials, I'm sure, um, for different insurance companies saying, if you bundle, you will save. So if you put your home, your vehicles, you know, your boat, your jewelry, if you put all those in the same insurance company, they will give you discounts for doing that. And companies offer different benefits. 
Um, some of them will cover a motorcycle. Some of them may not. Some of them offer you in-person visits. Others will be completely online. You will not ever physically see someone. Um, so you may pay different amounts depending on the company as well. All right, so a coverage question, something you may see on your homework. If Cindy has a $390,000 home that's insured for $304,000, based on the 80% coinsurance provision, how much would the insurance company pay on a claim that's $16,500. Assume there's no deductible. So she's not paying a deductible. She's got really expensive insurance, so they're just gonna pay 100% of it. So this is what you would do in this situation. First, you wanna figure out the required coverage. It tells you that they have an 80% coinsurance provision. So you're gonna take 0.8 times the value of the home, which was 390,000. This tells you the required coverage for the insurance company is 312,000. Then to figure out how much the claim payment is gonna be, so when we say a claim, that means something has happened, some kind of injury, some kind of damage, so maybe this was a tree falling on a house. Um, we are gonna take the coverage amount, the 304,000, divided by the required coverage, the 312 that we calculated, then we're gonna multiply it by the claim amount, which was 16,500. This tells us the insurance company is gonna give us a check for $16,076.92. Okay, and let's touch on automobile insurance. We've mainly been talking about homeowner's insurance. This is um, a little picture that's also in your book. There's two major categories that you're covering in your automobile insurance bodily injury coverage and property damage coverage. So you've got your automobile insurance will actually help pay for injuries um, of yours and for the other person in the other vehicle or other people in your vehicle. So it will pay some of the health um, health care amounts. So if you had to go to the hospital, if you broke your leg, it would pay a portion of that. And then the property damage, so we're talking about a car that was damaged, you know, if they hit something, let's say a house, then it would pay for a portion of that as well. So whenever you get auto insurance, you're gonna see the coverage expressed by three numbers. So in this example, it's 100 slash 300 slash 50. So let's talk about what each of those numbers mean. The first number, which in this example is 100, means that $100,000 is the maximum amount that the insurance company will pay for injuries of any one person. So they will, own, they will pay up to $100,000 for one person, okay? For each person, we should say, okay? And it could be a different number there, but in this situation, it's 100. The second number, which in this case is 300, says that 300,000 is the maximum amount the company will pay for all injured parties in one accident. So we're paying up to 100,000 per person, but the max on that is 300,000 total. So if you have a really big family, you need a 15 passenger van, then you probably want that number to be higher because those costs can really add up quick. And then the last number is the limit for payment for damage to property of others. So um, I have a relative whose house was hit by, I, I guess it was a drunk driver. The, the truck went through his bedroom. And so that guy's insurance would pay up to whatever that third number was on his. In this case, it's 50, which means 50,000 to go towards the damage of someone else's property. That does not mean that the other person, if they had 100,000 in damage, doesn't get the money. That means you are then liable to pay that difference. All right, so another example that you might see in your homework, Shan and Anita currently insured their cars with separate companies. So this is a couple, they each have different companies for their insurance. So. One of them is paying $810 a year. The other one's paying $655 a year. 
if they insured both cars with the same company, they would get a discount and they would save 10% on their annual premiums. What would be the future value of the annual savings over nine years if they were able to invest it at 6%? Okay, so if, if they were to bundle and save, they would save 10% on their total amount. And if they were to invest that at 6% over nine years, what would be the value of that in the future? It tells us we're going to use that exhibit 1B. First, let's figure out what the annual savings is going to be. We take our annual premiums. Here we had $810.655. We add those together. We take 10% of that. It's going to be $146.50. So every year we would save that much by them using the same automobile insurance company. To figure out the future value, we're going to take that annual savings, we're going to multiply it by the factor that we find on exhibit 1 slash B. So remember we would go to 6% at 9 years, that would give us 11.491. So our future value for doing this would be $1,683.43 if we invested it at 6% for 9 years. All right, that is all I've got for you today. I hope you have a wonderful rest of the week.